What if the Colts drafted Dan Marino in 1983? This is something I have not heard of a lot, surprisingly. Especially considering the fact that it almost happened. Don't believe me? I will talk about in this video how this almost happened in real life. So let's get into it. Says this changes a whole lot. And I mean a whole lot of the NFL in the 80s. So, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if an NFL theory? In the early 1980s, the Baltimore Colts at the time were in a very bad shape. In 1981, they went 2 and 14 with at the time, and I think still is today the worst defense of all time. And then in 1982, in the strike shortened year, they went 0-8-1. And because of that, they ended up getting the number one overall pick heading into the final year in Baltimore. However, it was a perfect time for them to get the number one overall pick as they went to the 1983 draft, which is one of the most infamous drafts of all time, full of Hall of Famers and Pro Bowlers, but most infamously of all, six quarterbacks taken in the first round alone, and three of them were Hall of Famers. And the one quarterback they had their eyes on was John Elway. However, he did not want to play for the Colts. But despite his objections, they still took him first overall. Within the next two weeks, he was then traded to the Broncos, where he would play his entire career with them retiring after 1998, leading the Broncos to become one of the main franchises in the NFL throughout the 80s and 90s, got them to five Super Bowls and won in the final two before retiring, and is a Hall of Famer. Meanwhile, later on the draft, Dan Marino was taken by the Dolphins, and he would play for him his entire career all the way up to 1999, and although he could not get a Super Bowl, he still set a whole bunch of records. He had the passing yards record, touchdowns, and of course season yards and touchdown record as well. However, what if the Colts took Dan Marino instead of Elway? That would be very interesting. So, let's get into the theory. As I mentioned earlier, this almost did happen in real life. So, how did this almost happen? Well, of course, as I mentioned, the, Bron the Colts G general manager, Ernie Accorsi at the time, was interested in getting John Elway regardless of what, he, what his objections of playing with the Colts. However, he did put the first round pick up for trade and the offer was it had to be a first round pick within the top five or six of 83 so within the next five picks a first round pick another first round pick in 1983 a first round pick in 1984 and two second round picks in 1983 and 84 if this trade happened he said they would have used that top five or six pick to take Dan Marino instead he mentioned this in the great ESPN 30 for 30 documentary Elway to Marino which talked about the 30th anniversary of the 1983 draft where they talked about the entire draft and how it all played out. Now of course I always wonder why not just take Marino in the first place because he actually talked with the Colts before the draft and he got along with them and practiced with them. But of course Ernie of course he said Elway was just a better player so we just had to take him regardless even though he didn't want to play with him at least El at least Marino wanted to play with you. But in the end, the trade never happened because they couldn't trade with anyone in their division like the Patriots wanted to do. No one could afford to trade. And one case particularly, the NFL might have screwed over the Raiders possibly from making a trade. But in this scenario, the trade still never happens. But in the end, for whatever reason, they just take Dan Marino and just get the problem out of the way and not have to deal with Elway. So now the question becomes two things. First, what happens with Elway? Well... Funny enough, he still would be with the Broncos. In our timeline, the Broncos were one of the teams that tried to trade that to that first pick for the Colts. However, they could not afford the deal that the Colts wanted. However, during negotiations, they found out the Colts were interested in offensive lineman Chris Hinton. And the Broncos actually drafted him to use him as a bargaining chip for a possible trade, which is what happened. He would be part of the trade to get Elway from the Colts. However, since... The Seahawks and Rams, I don't think we're going to take Elway since they need a running back really badly. The Broncos would have Elway fall to their laps and they just take him right then and there. And then finally, what happens with the Dolphins? By the time their, trade, their turn comes up, all six quarterbacks are taken. And I don't know of anyone else in that draft class that would have been anywhere near capable 
to do what El Marino could be in terms of talent. I think they probably would have just taken the next best player available. Because remember, after all, they just made the Super Bowl the year before. So they had Dan Woodley. They were fine, at least for right now, in their eyes. So maybe in the future they can get their future quarterback. With the possibility of relocation still in the air, Marino and the Colts got right to work in the season. And holy crap, the season was unbelievable. As the Colts had an incredible turnaround. Their defense, which has been very bad the last bunch of years, ended up being really good in 1983. And thanks to Dan Marino having a near MVP rookie season, the Colts surprised everyone by going 12-4, their best season since the 70s. Meanwhile, for the Broncos, things start off normally as usual. However, the interesting thing is the Broncos and Colts play each other twice that year. Now, the first game was in Baltimore Week 2. Elway did not play in that game in real life, so he wouldn't play in this game. However, in Week 15, oh, that would be big as the Colts visited the Broncos. And in that game, the Colts had a 19-0 lead going to the fourth quarter, and then Elway made a big comeback to win the game 21-19 to get the Broncos in the playoffs. And of course, this would be Elway Marino's first matchup in this timeline. But with Marino being the quarterback, I think they, the Colts would get at least one extra score to prevent the comeback and get the win here. So the Broncos instead finished 7-9. and nine. A big improvement from the 2-7 and seven record from last year, but not enough to make the playoffs this time around. But the Dolphins? Oh boy. Oh boy, things would be trouble for them. In, our, in real life, the Dolphins struggled at the beginning of 1983. They were 3-3 free free after 6 games before they finally made Dan Marino the starter and he saved their season as they went, finished up 12-4 and four, making it into the playoffs. But without Marino, that sluggish offense is not going to go anywhere and the Dolphins end up regressing and finished 9-7. and seven. As we take a look at the updated 83 standings, nothing changes on the NFC side but the AFC changes as the Colts now have the second seed instead of the Dolphins and the Dolphins fall all the way down to the fifth seed and into the playoffs. In the AFC side wildcard would begin with the Dolphins at the Seahawks as these two teams play each other in real life in the divisional round with the Dolphins hosting it and of course the Seahawks spanked the Dolphins on the road but now they're the home team and without Marino the Seahawks easily would get the win here. And then in the divisional round, the Seahawks would visit the Colts. The Colts' first home playoff game in six years, pretty much. And unfortunately for the Colts, just like in real life with the Dolphins, the Seahawks would come into the town and beat the Colts, with even with Marino. As at this point, the Seahawks just had the Marino's number at this point in his career. But with that, the rest of the playoffs remains the same as the Raiders still beat the Redskins in the Super Bowl. It is now 1984 and a big, big important part of this video and I got to talk about the history of this because in 1984 is when the Colts moved to Indianapolis away from Baltimore. Now here's the backstory of what happened. Throughout the 70s, the Colts played in Memorial Stadium and shared it with the Orioles. However, the stadium was obsolete pretty much and was not compatible for both teams and they needed a new stadium really badly. And in the 70s, they actually proposed a stadium called the Balto Dome, which would be an indoor stadium for both both teams and also be compatible for any possible NBA and NHL team that comes into Baltimore. However, the city at the time was not interested in getting anything going. And in fact, in the 70s, the city actually passed a referendum that would bar any funding to build any new stadium which destroyed any chance of building a new stadium for the Colts and Orioles. And as the years went on, eventually renegotiations just broke down so badly that the day before the Colts were moved to Indianapolis, the city of Baltimore tried to pass an eminent domain bill that would have taken ownership of the Colts away like a government takeover and prevent them from leaving. And that's what led to the infamous Mayflower leave overnight to Indianapolis. But maybe, just maybe in this scenario, with the Colts, with a rookie quarterback, making the playoffs and looking really good, possibly a Super Bowl contender next year, maybe the Colts and the city of Baltimore can get their act together and actually start negotiating. And that's what they do in this timeline after the 83 playoffs. However, the main sticking point is that referendum. Until that's gone, 
they cannot build any new stadium with um, public funding. So eventually, they worked out a deal. The Colts would stay in Baltimore for 1984. And that law that was passed in the 70s that would bar funding for the stadium would go up to vote either, either in the city or the state to vote in the 84 elections on whether or not to give the Colts a new stadium or not. So, the Colts... Still precarious, but this year, they are still staying in Baltimore for at least another year. Leaving the city of Indianapolis high and dry for a team at least for another year. As the looming threat of possible relocation continues throughout 84, the Colts try their best to ignore it and try to remain competitive and be a Super Bowl contender in 84. However, the team was a hit and miss. Offensively, Dan Marino put up an even better season, although he probably would not set the 5,000 yards and the 48 touchdowns he did in our timeline because the Colts offense was not as good as the Dolphins, but he definitely would have an incredible near MVP season as the Colts offense is legit and one of the best in the league. However, their defense took a massive nosedive the year before, nowhere near as good as it was the previous year, and the Colts ended up declining and they ended up finishing 9-7. and seven. Meanwhile, for the Dolphins, their struggle continues as they still cannot get their quarterback that they need badly. And I think Dan Woodley at this point retired, so either he's still playing or a journeyman or someone else is playing. But regardless, their offense has nothing going for them, especially since they don't have Marino, so they're not going to have the number one offense in the league. And their suspect defense is not is going to keep holding them back. So the Dolphins ended up regressing again as they finished 8-8 eight and eight and not looking really good whatsoever. As we then get into looking at the 1984 stand-ins, nothing changed on the NFC side. The AFC changes as the Broncos, thanks to the Dolphins not being a power, end up getting the number one seed as the Colts end up getting the second seed despite being 9-7 as they take the Dolphins' spot as they won the division. And then in the divisional round, the Seahawks would once again visit the Colts in the playoffs and the Colts Desperately want to get some revenge this year, but the Seahawks put up a lot of power offensive firepower in this game as this game was really offensive However, after a full se second year of playing Dan Marino comes up to the challenge and leads the Colts downfield to get the game-winning score to send the Colts to their first AFC Championship appearance in 13 years and in the AFC Championship thanks to the Steelers beating the Broncos the Colts host the Steelers in the AFC Championship and in another offensive display, Dan Marino shows why he was an MVP contender that year as he torches the Steelers' defense and the Colts, despite struggling this year, surprised everyone as they did it. They made it back to the Super Bowl after 14 years away. And in the Super Bowl, they would have to face the 49ers, who had the best record at the time at 15-1 with the number one defense. Of course, the Dolphins played the 49ers in this game, so Marino would still be here. And in that game, the Dolphins got destroyed pretty much by the 49ers. And with the Colts being work worse this time around, the 49ers are going to easily still get the win as the Colts got destroyed in the Super Bowl. As I mentioned, throughout 1984, the threat of relocation for the Colts was still up in the air as there was no idea what would happen. They had to rely mainly on on the referendum being repealed in the upcoming 84 election. Well, then the 84 election came around, and with the Colts doing much better and still being a Super Bowl contender possibly, the city of Baltimore actually voted to repeal the law, which is what they did in real life in the 84 election after the Colts left. But now with that out of the way, now the city of Baltimore can fund, I mean, help fund the stadium if they need to. As the negotiations continue after the 84 playoffs ended, in March 1985, a deal was finally made. The city of Baltimore and the Colts and the Orioles too would help fund the original Balta Dome that was conceived back in the 70s. They would have to play in Memorial Stadium until 1987 when they can finally move to Memorial Stadium and they signed a two-year lease to play in Memorial Stadium for the next two years. And with that, the Colts are staying in Baltimore. So now, what does the city of Indianapolis do? They can no longer get the Colts, and they have the RCA domes just built a few years ago just sitting around doing nothing. I would not worry too much about them, as with a brand new city, and at this point in the NFL's life, 
There were a lot of relocations at the time, so there just might be a chance for them still to get a team. But we'll have to wait and see after 1985. After just falling short of winning the championship, and now with their future secured in Baltimore, the Colts had all that pressure gone, and they focused right back to work on making it back to the Super Bowl. The defense played a little bit better. Marino, unfortunately, took a little bit of a step back. But unfortunately for the Colts, despite them doing better, the AFC East was very competitive that year with the Jets and Patriots being major threats. So the Colts end up improving to 11-5, but this time around, it's not enough to win the division. But one big highlight for the Colts would be in week 14, when they visited the undefeated Bears. Yeah, the previous week, the Bears had their infamous Monday night game against the Dolphins, but without Dan Marino, the Bears win that game. But now, the next week, they had to host the Colts, and Dan Marino proved up to the challenge as he torched that Bears defense at home and to give the Bears, once again, their first and only loss that year. Meanwhile, problems for the Dolphins continue. They still can't get their future quarterback, and without Dan Marino saving them, they suffer big losses in 1985. The Dolphins struggled a lot at the beginning of the year before Marino and the Dolphins rallied to finish 12-4, but without him, the offense is not good, the defense is crap, and the Dolphins ended up finishing 4-12, their first losing season in a decade, as nothing, absolutely nothing is going right for the Dolphins. In the updated 1985 stands, nothing changes once again on the NFC side. The AFC side changes a lot as the Jets now win the division and the AFC East and got the second seed. The Patriots move up to the fourth seed as the Colts make the playoffs but are the fifth seed. And the AFC side will begin with the Colts visiting the Patriots in this AFC East matchup. This would be one hell of a battle in the AFC side of the playoffs. But despite being at home, I think the Colts actually can go up there and upset the Patriots and prevent their Cinderella season run. And then in the AFC Divisional round, the Colts would now have to visit the Raiders. Unfortunately for the Colts, the Raiders were a kryptonite to Dan Marino at this point in his career. He just could not beat them efficiently. He always struggled against them. And this would show up here as they beat the Colts. And following the Jets beating the Browns, the AFC Championship is now the Jets at the Raiders. And after looking at the stats between the Jets and the Patriots, I found out something. The Jets actually were better than the Patriots. So that got me thinking. If the Patriots could beat the Raiders on the road, how could the Jets not when they're even better than the Patriots? And that's why I decide that the Jets will beat the Raiders on the road and they make their first Super Bowl appearance in 17 years. And with that, Super Bowl 20 is now the Jets and the Bears. However, of course, even though the Jets were better, who are we kidding? The Bears would destroy them. After all, they did just beat them in New York just a few weeks earlier. After 1985, we gotta go back to the city of Indianapolis now, as they have the possibility of getting their own team now. Because remember, like I said, at the time, at this point in the 80s for the NFL, there were a lot of teams relocating. We had three relocations during the 80s in real life. We had the Raiders in 1982 move from Oakland to LA, then the Colts leaving Baltimore to Indianapolis in 84, and then the Cardinals leaving St. Louis to Glendale in 80, 80, I mean 88, and those are the relocations that actually did happen. There were more that could have possibly happened throughout the 80s that actually ended up somewhat happening in the 90s or somewhat. And those possibilities are right here for Indianapolis. As in, as 1985 continued on, there were two teams that could relocate to Indianapolis. The Saints and the Cardinals. Now for the Saints, going into 1985, they were threatening to relocate soon to Jacksonville. However, in May of 85, Tom Benson bought the team and he managed to keep them in New Orleans, which is still to this day. So that's not happening here. However, the Cardinals is still a possibility. Because remember, the Cardinals relocated to Glendale in 1988. Now, with Indianapolis a possibility, they have two options. Phoenix or Indianapolis. And when you compare them, Indianapolis is honestly a better option. First, they are closer to St. Louis 
than St. Louis is to Phoenix, so it wouldn't affect the fans as much as it would be when they moved to Glendale, and it'd also be better for traveling costs, and it would be good for the NFC East to not be so out of the way with a team out in Arizona when they're, in the, when they're supposed to be on the East. Two, the stadium is brand new and indoors, which would save them from the elements, and being brand new instead of being Sun Devil Stadium, which was made back in the 50s, they would have to share it with a college football team in the area, and the climate for September and October would not be good for NFL whatsoever, pretty much. And of course, with RCA Dome being more modern, it had better amenities and all of that, which they wouldn't have to share with any college football team in Glendale. So, I think the, uh, the choice is kind of obvious. And then, instead of leaving in 1988 to Glendale, the Cardinals decided to move to Indianapolis after 1985, and in 1986, they became the Indianapolis Cardinals. It took them two years longer in our timeline, but they finally got their team. In their final year playing in Memorial Stadium, the Colts look once again poised to try and make a Super Bowl run. However, it would be a season of epic disaster. The defense, which was good the year before, was absolute shit. Absolute shit, nothing. It was terrible. And unfortunately, Dan Marino had a setback year as he was not good statistically this year as he was the previous year. And the Colts ended up having their first losing season in in four years as they ended up finishing 7-9 and nine and missing the playoffs. Meanwhile, the struggle continues for the Dolphins. Another year, and not without a quarterback. As, of course, during this period after the 83 draft, there would not be a really good quarterback other than, other than Boomer Sison than Vinny Testaverde in 87. The Dolphins continue to struggle as like they did in our timeline. And nothing goes their way as they once again finish 4-12, and and after four years of regression, two straight losing seasons, Don Shula decides to retire instead of playing, I mean, coaching them for another 10 years. Still would be a Hall of Fame caliber career, although it would not be as incredible as it is in our timeline. In the 1986 standings, the NFC side changes as the Rams thanks to not losing the Dolphins in our timeline, ended up winning the NFC West as they now have the third seed as the 49ers fall to the fifth seed. In the AFC side, it changes the Jets now win the division with the third seed as the Chiefs make the playoffs as the fourth seed still and the Bengals manage to make into the playoffs which they didn't do in our timeline. And since I don't think the 49ers could beat the Redskins on the road, nor do I think the Rams could beat the Giants, nothing changed on the NFC side as the Giants still make the Super Bowl. And then in the AFC side, we'll start with the Bengals at the Chiefs. Two teams that struggled the year before make it into the playoffs. But I think the Chiefs would get it this time. As they were more balanced than the Bengals. And they did beat the Bengals at home in week one of the year. So I don't see why they couldn't beat them again. Only to be just like the Jets, beaten by the Browns. And speaking of the Jets, they would lose to the Broncos. And with that, nothing changes in the playoffs. As the Broncos still get beaten by the Giants in the Super Bowl. It is now 1987, and the Colts begin their new journey in the Balto Dome for the 1987 season. Finally, after all these decades, they got their new stadium. And oh boy, it was a season to remember. Offensively, Dan Marino had a bounce back year and played pretty good, but more importantly, the defense had a gigantic improvement. Not only did they get good, not only did they get better, they ended up having the number one defense in 1987. And with this combined with Dan Marino having a good year, the Colts have a massive improvement as they jump all the way up to 13-2 and in the strike shortened year. Meanwhile, misery continues down in Miami for the Dolphins as they did not have a bad enough season to get the number one pick to get Vinny Testaverde. So once again, no quarterback for them. However, defensively, they played a little bit better this year. So going into 88, their defense would probably be their main strength. And the Dolphins, thanks to the strike short year, did technically improve as they ended up going 4-11. But yikes, four, I mean, three straight four-win seasons with no progress whatsoever, pretty much, other than the defense, not looking good for them. 
In the updated 1987 standings in the NFC side, the Redskins and Bears swap places, but the AFC changes a lot. As the Colts now have the number one seed, the Broncos fall all the way down to the second seed, the Browns fall to the third seed, and the wild cards remain the same. And in the divisional round, the Oilers visit the Colts in Baltimore Dome's first ever playoff game. But despite their best and the beginning of their 80s, 90s dynasty run, the Oilers were no match for the Colts as the Colts took care of them and were in the AFC Championship for the first time in three years. And then the legendary matchup finally happened as it's now the Broncos at the Colts in the AFC Championship. Dan Marino and John Elway's first ever playoff game against each other and it is with the Super Bowl on the line. But with the better defense and Dan Marino at home, the Colts shut down the Broncos and make it to the Super Bowl for the second time in four years. And then the Super Bowl out in San Diego would be the Battle of the Beltway as the Baltimore Colts played the Redskins in a DC Baltimore matchup. That would be incredible. Now, of course, the Redskins beat the Broncos in this game because their offensive line allowed Timmy Smith to get all those lanes to rush for the Super Bowl record over 200 yards rushing. However, the Colts had a much better defense than the Broncos in our timeline and a much better run defense. So they probably are not going to let him get as open as he did in our timeline. And also Dan Marino played better than John Elway that year. And I don't think they're going to shut him down as easily as they did Elway in the Super Bowl. I think the Colts would be in a much better position than the Redskins are. And I think the Colts would eke out a win. And with that, the Colts, after 17 years, would finally get their first Super Bowl. And Dan Marino would finally get his first Super Bowl in this timeline too. And no longer have a career overshadowed by not winning the big one. Now that will wrap up this video. As I've done five years already and we're almost 30 minutes in i actually plan on coming back to this later on but for right now i'm going to end it right here so after 1987 the colts are in a much better situation than they are in our timeline as they made the playoffs four times instead of just one in real life during this span they made it to the super bowl twice and won one too and more importantly they are still in baltimore so that is a massive improvement than our timeline for the Broncos, they still got Elway, but unfortunately, their legacy is not as good as they don't make the Super Bowl in 87, and he doesn't have that in good season 83 to get him back in the playoffs. So it's not good for him, but who knows, maybe the going on, it'll still be pretty good for him. The Dolphins are absolute shit. Nothing has gone their way. They made the playoffs just one time, and they had just two non-losing seasons in this timeline and no Super Bowl appearance whatsoever as they still don't have their franchise quarterback that they needed in Marino. And as for the Indianapolis Cardinals, I don't think anything would change even with their relocation change, so they're going to play exactly how they are in this timeline. But hey, it's just a theory, an NFL theory. Thanks for watching. Oh man, I wanted to do this for so long and I finally got to it and I had so much fun talking about this. I can't wait till in the future when I come back to this. Oh boy, that will be interesting to see what will happen for the Colts and them after they won the Super Bowl. Will the Broncos continue their dominance? Will the Dolphins ever make their comeback and be a dominant team in the 90s maybe? We'll have to wait and see till then. So see you guys next time as next theory, we're coming back to the 21st century and that will be great.